In the summer of 1992, Norwich City were rubbish. You can ask anyone. They'd finished the last season in 18th, picking up just one point from their final eight games. Rubbish. That summer, they replaced manager Dave Stringer with one of his coaches, someone called Mike Walker, whose last managerial job had been at Colchester United five years previously. To make matters worse, on the eve of the new season, top goalscorer Robert Fleck forced through a move to Chelsea for £2.1 million. The pundits were almost unanimous. Norwich City were going down. But it didn't quite work out like that. The first sign that something weird was about to happen came on the opening day of the inaugural Premier League season. Norwich were away at Arsenal, tipped by some as title contenders, and at half-time, they were 2-0 down. The players rather expected Walker to tell them to go into damage limitation mode, but damage limitation mode wasn't really a concept Walker understood. He told them to keep attacking, and they won 4-2. Four days later, they faced Chelsea at Carrow Road, with Fleck watching from the stands. And they won that game too, with Fleck's replacement, Mark Robbins, scoring his third goal of the season. Four points were dropped against Everton and Manchester City, but then Norwich went on a ludicrous run, beating Crystal Palace, Nottingham Forest, Southampton, Chelsea again, because the fixture computer was a Spectrum 48k with a wobbly power pack, and Sheffield Wednesday. It was all very strange. Norwich had few players of any note. Brian Gunn was a club legend, Rule Fox was an emerging talent, and young Chris Sutton looked a bit special, but for the most part, these were hitherto unspectacular footballers, playing out of their skins, a sort of proto-Leicester, if you will. The giants of English football breathed a huge sigh of relief on October the 3rd, when big-spending, Alan Shearer-infused Blackburn Rovers spanked seven past Norwich and ended their impetuous run. Two games later, Liverpool, then struggling in the bottom half, put four past them and knocked them off the top of the table. The bubble had burst. Except it hadn't, because Norwich's response to getting knocked off the top was to scramble back up there again. In quick succession, they beat Oldham, Sheffield United, Aston Villa and Wimbledon. Suddenly, it was December the 5th, and Norwich had 39 of the 42 points that Walker had joked they needed just to be reasonably sure of avoiding relegation. But more than that, they were 8 points clear at the top of the table. Brilliantly, they'd also conceded 31 goals, more than all but three teams from the rest of the division. (laughs) Not that Walker cared. I'd happily win 4-3 all season, he said. You get three points for 4-3. You only get one for nil-nil. But it couldn't last. On December the 12th, Manchester United beat them by a single goal at Carrow Road. And then came an even worse result. A 2-0 defeat at home to hated rivals Ipswich Town. After all the talk of 4-3s, Norwich went five games without scoring. And they didn't win again until January the 27th. Norwich were tenacious though. They wouldn't give up on the title race. They beat fellow challengers Aston Villa at the end of March, and when Manchester United came to Carrow Road, hungrily pursuing their first title in 26 years, the Canaries were topped by a single point, but United played them off the park. Another gubbing, 5-1 at the hands of Tottenham, left Norwich seven points adrift of Alex Ferguson's men. And then another defeat to Ipswich of all teams, finally ended any lingering hopes of glory. Norwich City finished the season in third, magnificently with a negative goal difference, having conceded 65 goals in a 42-match campaign. But it was enough to secure UEFA Cup football and an unforgettable Jeremy Goss-powered night against Bayern Munich. But that is another story. If there's a particular club history you'd like to see us cover, please leave a comment or tweet it at Ian McIntosh. Thanks for watching.